Welcome back everybody to A-Level Global Politics or Geopolitics. We're continuing our discussion of the political dimensions of global governance. And we're going to focus on another institution within the United Nations, that being the Economic and Security Council. Oh, sorry, the Economic and Social Council, should I say. Um, this is the final of the main organs that we're going to examine as part of this sort of introductory series into the United Nations. Uh, and it's going to be described as uh, the UN ECOSOC, which is just another um, way of uh, explaining what it is. <laughs> and it is a, a, an, instance of, an institution sorry, of the United Nations, which acts to coordinate development by the united nations in line with the commitments of the organization as towards the protection of economic social environmental rights and development so it's quite a broad mandate that is given to the uh, to the un's ecosoc uh, as to what it actually is in line to do what it's actually supposed to be doing as part of uh, its mandate within the un and the member states there are 54 that are elected and they are elected by the un general assembly and they have a significant emphasis placed on the representation from the developing world. Now, this is very interesting because you might be wondering why that is the case. And for uh, those who are particularly astute, you will know that when we talk about things relating to the protection of economic and social rights and uh, economic and social development, as well as environmental rights and development, there is a heavy emphasis on the kind of detrimental impact that can be had on countries within the developing world, namely things like places like the global south. The global south, as I've mentioned in a previous lesson, are the countries that are at most most at risk for the 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 detrimental impact that climate change is going to have and is continuing to have on those states. So you can understand why, from an environmental perspective, they would have a greater representation at the UN ECOSOC. But there's also the economic problems and this idea that there is a certain amount of what some international legal theorists would describe as a kind of economic imperialism, whereby the developed countries in the world, the, the global north, western countries, superpowers like the US and China, are dumping millions and billions of pounds or dollars or, or, or yen into these other developing countries as a way to uh, garner a certain amount of soft power and a certain amount of economic ownership of those particular regions, something known as economic imperialism. And one example of how this has been the case is with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative as an example. So you can understand why the UN General Assembly would want to see that a significant emphasis is placed on the representation from the developing world when we look at who gets to decide about uh, the kind of development initiatives that are in place at the UN ECOSOC. So the uh, Economic and Social Council works to coordinate essentially other agencies within the United Nations. And these are described sometimes as subsidiary agencies. So for example, the World Health Organization falls under this uh, remit. The Office of the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees is in this uh, area, as well as the World Food Program as well. So before I just take a sip of this drink and we move on to looking at the, uh, the next of these um, elements, uh, I want you to think about what potentially are the strengths and weaknesses of this descriptive reality that we have uh, described for ourselves here. So I've explained what the UN ECOSOC does. So we talk about the coordination uh, of development of these different kinds of areas of, of policy, like economic, social and environmental. I've talked about the fact that there is a heavy emphasis on uh, developing countries within the developing world when it comes to representation on UN ECOSOC. And I've talked about the coordination that is in place when it comes to the subsidiary UN agencies, so the WHO, the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, as well as the World Food Programme. So what could be the strengths? Think about that first. And what could be the weaknesses of this institution? Why could this institution be criticised? And in a second, we'll get into what these uh, strengths and weaknesses actually are. I'm trying my best to not drink coffee, so... <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on and look at the strengths, oops, sorry, the strengths and weaknesses of the UN ECOSOC. So, beginning with the strengths, 
We can examine the strengths uh, through the lens of its various subsidiary institutions. One of the good things about the Economic and Social Council is that because it coordinates all of these different subsidiary institutions, we can almost suggest that the, the strengths and the successes of these institutions can be seen somewhat as extending to the success of ECOSOC. So the most obvious example is the World Health Organization being instrumental in the eradication or the near eradication of a number of crippling diseases worldwide. So the eradication of polio, for example, is a good indication of this, and the near eradication of leprosy uh, around the world as well, as seen as instrumental, instrumental successes that the World Health Organization has been able to achieve. Similarly, in terms of global administration efforts to, that took place during the last great uh, global uh, health crisis, that being the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure we all remember that, um, the WHO did lead the way, uh, despite the fact that it got a lot of criticism, it did lead the way in terms of the ways in which it administered global efforts to uh, to different places and parts around the world and different instances of, of, of policy advice when it came to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Similarly, we can talk about strengths that are held when it comes to the World Food Programme. The World Food Programme boasts the largest initiative in the field of humanitarian intervention in the world. Per annum, they deliver more than 15 billion emergency food rations per year. So you can understand that if we talk about through the lens of uh, disaster law and humanitarian intervention and the way in which um, states or institutions or global initiatives like the World Food Programme have the ability to intervene uh, within the field of humanitarian aid into these uh, either um, troubled areas as a result of uh, environmental disasters, international armed conflicts, these things are incredibly important, and this is the largest initiative in the world for that particular instance. When it comes to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, we have a uh, another series of issues that we can actually examine. So within the field of international refugee law, there are said to be arguably over 70 million displaced people worldwide. Now, displacement can take place either through internal displacement, which you technically wouldn't be considered to be an, a refugee in that regard, or external displacement, displaced into different states as a result of a number, a multitude of different reasons. It can be environmental reasons. It can be fleeing political persecution from dictatorships, it could be fleeing war and armed conflict, it could be fleeing genocide and, and, and crimes against humanity, it could be any of these potential reasons for uh, for you to become a refugee who needs to seek asylum in other places. And there are over 70 million displaced worldwide. And what the UN High Commissioner for Refugees does is it represents the main international institution which provides for support in regard to this particular issue. So they enter into conflict zones in, for example, Syria, Palestine, South Sudan, and as of recently, uh, one of the largest refugee crises that we've seen um, within the last few years, especially in Europe, is that, of course, of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in March of 2022. And this uh, led to millions of Ukrainian refugees um, having to flee into countries like Poland and Germany and then coming all the way across and spreading around across uh, the rest of Europe. And so conflict zones in Syria and Palestine and, and, and South Sudan are, are very important, as well as um, very new conflicts that have been um, coming up into uh, in development in terms of countries like Ukraine. So those are some of the strengths of the UN Economic and Social Council. But what about the weaknesses? What what kinds of things can we criticize the Economic and Social Council for? Well, arguably the most fundamental of these weaknesses is the fact that what it does is it lacks a very clear motivation and direction in form of in the form of policy making. So I kind of alluded to this at the start of this lesson because we mentioned that it seems to have quite a broad mandate in terms of economic, social, environmental development. But it doesn't really seem to be very specific as to what these things actually entail. So it gives us something of a global bureaucracy whereby there are sort of uh, sub institutions like the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization, the, uh, the, the High Commission for Refugees, where they report to UN ECOSOC rather than UN ECOSOC actually doing anything specifically themselves. So there's no real direction in the form of policy making. It's just a clear, broad mandate to develop and work on economic and social and environmental development. 
One could also make the argument that ECOSOC is not in, as instrumental in terms of economic development as other institutions within the realm of international economic law. So it's sort of been overtaken by other institutions that are uh, maybe subsidiary to the United Nations, but are not actually organs of the United Nations. So, for example, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, 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 as well as um, other uh, more subsidiary institutions such as UNCTRAL, the UN uh, Commission for International Trade Law as well as the World Trade Organization. Uh, and again, I'm going to disagree with the uh, uh, with the textbook because what the textbook argues here is that developing countries are less influential in these institutions. And I would agree with that in the case that the World Bank and the IMF and UNCITRAL are not particularly very representative of, uh, of developing countries. But that's not the kind of sentiment that you can really present for the World Trade Organization because the World Trade Organization is very representative of all countries, especially developing countries. That's one of the main strengths of the World Trade Organization, I would argue. So, again, arguing with the textbook, um, pick a side, whichever one you want, I don't mind. Um, so, essentially, this is one of the things that we can argue as a critique of ECOSOC, that why do we need a ECOSOC if we've got the WTO, if we've got UNCITRAL, if we've got the IMF, if we've got the World Bank, these ways in which we regulate uh, international economic law. So, so what's the point in ECOSOC? Uh, and so you may make that argument if you want to. But I think if you're going to make an argument on the strengths and weaknesses of ECOSOC, you have to balance out the fact that while there may not be clear motivation and there may not be a clear uh, mandate in terms of what it actually is setting out to do, and while there may be other economic institutions that are more uh, impactful in terms of their regulation, so once the trial and WTO and IMF and World Bank, the you can't underestimate the impact that uh, ECOSOC has had in terms of its uh, adjudication of authority in instances like the World Health Organization, uh, like the World Food Program, and like the High Commissioner for Refugees.